G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. It is DIY time. Yes, we're going to build helical antenna. In fact, it can be any kind of helical antenna you want. It can be left hand, it can be right hand, it can be three, five, seven, or even eight turns if you want it to be, just depending on what you're looking for. Now, a lot of people just simply use the standard skew planar or cloverleaf antennas that come with a lot of stuff. Or Some people even use the rubber ducky antennas that I compared last time or in an earlier review. But to be honest, um, you know, Something with a bit of gain gives you more range. And if you've got goggles with diversity, at least one of your, well, one of your antennas should be a gain antenna so that you can point your head in the direction of the model and get a better picture. Uh, so we're going to build a helical because it's one of the easiest types of antennas to build. And they're fairly intolerant of minor mistakes in terms of measurement and construction. So they're a pretty safe antenna to build. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to build a seven turn helical and we're going to go and test it. Then I'm going to cut it down to three turns, or five turns, then three turns, because I want you to see the difference that the number of turns makes in terms of the amount of gain we get, that is how good a picture we get at a distance, and in terms of how wide the beam is. So I'm going to use my good old little 25 milliwatt mini quad for the tests with a crappy camera. Hopefully the sun will be out when I go outside. But first of all, I'm going to show you how to build your helical antenna. Now you'll need some bits and pieces, obviously. And um, the first thing you're gonna need is some wire. Now I just get this electrical wire. You can go down to the electrical wholesale shop, buy this, it's multi-strand. These are about one millimeter diameter pieces of wire. That's about a handy size to work with. It's pure copper wire, very easy to work with. So you just, it comes like that. You can see, and you just strip it back till you get the length of wire that you want. Easy peasy, and very, very, very cheap. Just go and buy a couple of meters, a couple of yards of this from your local electrical wholesaler. Well, you might even have some floating around in the basement somewhere, providing it's not actually carrying electricity, you should be all right to use it. Now, also you're going to need a former. Now, if you've got a 3D printer or you know someone who's got a 3D printer, then you can get them to print you up one of these little formers of Thingiverse. The, little, the, the plans are on Thingiverse, so you can go and get those and, and print them up. Makes life pretty simple because there's also a former which I've lost. Oh no, there it is. It comes with a former you can print up and that enables you to just spiral the wire up, gets the right diameter, the right spacing. It's not perfect, but it's close enough. And then by using those two things and a conductive reflector on the back, you get your helical antenna. Now I'm going to assume you don't have a 3D printer. So I'm going to show you the old fashioned way, which means you just get a piece of plastic pipe. As you can see, I got two meters of this from the local hardware shop for $8. So I could make a lot of helical antennas out of this. Um, and you just cut it, I've just cut this to a random length, I know that's going to be long enough for a seven turn helical. Um, and the only thing to be very careful about is to make sure that it is plastic, it's not metal, there's no foil or there's nothing in there that's going to be metallic because that will completely ruin your antenna. You could use a wooden dowel for that, but I'm not a fan of using wood because wood contains moisture usually, even very dry wood has a degree of moisture, and the moisture can quite significantly affect the performance of your helical antenna. So better to use something that can't absorb moisture, which is plastic. So I use a plastic thing. It could be a solid rod, but pipe is going to be lighter. And if you've got this hanging off your goggles, you want it pretty light. This is a very light piece of oops, plastic. There we go. Now you're going to need some, probably need some coax to go between your helical and your goggles or your receiver. This is what we call semi-rigid coax. Now I've done a video on coaxes before. I'll try and remember to link it in the description. But this is a coax. When you bend it, it stays bent. That's kind of handy, really. Um, which means that you can position the angle of the goggles on your forehead and so forth. Now, some um, helical antennas, like the circular wireless, they actually don't bother with it. They just have the they have a, what they call a, a uh, what the hell is it? Bulkhead mount on the back of the reflector, and then you can just put your things on this. They don't actually connect a, a wire straight up to the to the antenna itself, they just put a connector on there. You could do that with this setup here if you wanted to, but remember every connector represents a small loss of signal. So if you want to get maximum effect, it's probably a good idea to do it like, um, oh, here we go. <coughs> Here's one that I, I've used this an awful lot, this helical. Um, use that, see they've just wired it straight into the back and that's what we'll do on this one. And again, it's semi-rigid coax because you can straighten it up and it stays straight or you can bend it and it bends. There you go, and it's just got a right angle connector on the back there and I've got a right angle down here. We'll do pretty much the same thing. Now, it's interesting to note there's a lot of black magic in antennas. I've said this before and I'll say it again. There's a lot of black magic in antennas, right? Um, because that antenna works really well, right? It's a perfectly good antenna. Yet, if you look at it, um, it looks pretty similar to that. You know this pretty much. But look at the size of the reflectors. See the difference in reflector sizes? And so this also works extremely well. So the reflector size really should be um, a multiple of a wavelength or a wavelength thereof, but it's not in the case of this. So 
how does that work? It's not even, a, it's like, it's three quarters. So it shows you, it's black magic. <laughs> Theory does not always work in practice when it comes to antenna. So that's why I'm happy we're going to build an antenna. And as you can see, because there's this sort of high flexibility in terms of sizing and spacings and things, if you are not that accurate in your build, it's probably still going to work reasonably well. Well, it probably won't work as well as it could, but it'll still be better than nothing. And so what we're going to use for the back plate is, in this case, Circular Waters have used a piece of aluminium. They've turned a piece of aluminium up. That's really nice. It's very strong, um, very rigid. It's a nice reflective area. Perfect. Um, on this one, just a piece of circuit board. See on the back? Circuit board. So that's what I'm going to use, piece of circuit board. Ta-da! There you go. And I've just... I've cut it to shape. I haven't turned it on a lathe or anything. It's just been filed by hand. I used my uh, my compass here, my protract. What is it? Oh God, no, my yeah, my compass here to dial a circle of the right diameter, and then uh, just basically cut around there and then file it so it comes up to the mark. So it, it's not millimeter perfect, but it's near enough. Hopefully, as we'll see in the tests. Um, so yeah, those are the bits and pieces we need. You obviously need a ruler because you want to measure stuff. Um, you want some pins to mark stuff. You want some side cutters to cut wire and you want a soldering iron which is just over here out of shot because you want to solder some wire up and that's really all there is to it so I'm just going to go through the basic steps now and show you what I'm going to do right first of all the plastic pipe you need to cut it to some rough length um, you can wait till the end of the video and see what length you need for various counts in fact I can measure it on these ones because it'll be pretty close to these ones this is the seven turn circular wireless antenna and it's it's um it's 90 millimeters long from the base to the end of that. So oh, this is probably pretty close to 90 because I just eyeballed it. Yeah, look at that, it's just under 100. Um, and then the five term one here, that is six, what is it? Um, 60, 64 millimeters. So you get an idea, somewhere up between, uh, you know, four inches and, you know, three inches and four inches is probably good as gold, depending on the amount of gain you want. Because remember, the more turns on your antenna, the more gain you have, but the narrower the beam. There's always that big trade-off. We've seen that before. Okay, so I've got some, you could, this could be anything conductive. It could be a piece of copper, a piece of steel, a piece of aluminium, but circular wireless have used aluminium, but there's a problem with aluminium for most people is how do you actually solder to it? If you want to put your coax directly onto that back plate, you can't easily solder to aluminium. So, um, you know, you could even cut the back off an old bean tin, to be totally honest. As long as it's nice and flat and you cut it to the right size, the back of a bean tin will work as your reflector, honestly. But it has to remain pretty flat, because if you get any bends in it, it's going to screw up the reflections, cause you to lose gain. Right, let me um, start going through this step by step. Step number one, go and find yourself some 15 millimeter pipe. There you go, 15 millimeters. This is actually 14.9, but that is near enough. 15 millimeter diameter on the outside. We're going to, that's going to hold, that's our former, that's going to hold our wire in place. Get that, cut it to about 100 mils or somewhere between 70 and 100 millimeters, depending on how much gain you're going to be wanting. It doesn't matter if the wire only goes up this far and you leave the rest plugging, it just gets a bit unwieldy if it's too long. Right, next step, find yourself something for a backing plate, for a reflector. There you go. Uh, this should be, from memory, is it 56 millimeters is what I've decided to use. So let me just put my ruler on here. Oh no, 52 millimeters, sorry. See, my memory's crap. It's getting old, it's no much, not much fun at all. 52 millimeters is the size of that reflector, and it's a circle. And what I've done here, let me just pull in a bit and I'll show you. Now you can see I've put some marker pen on the copper there, and I've just drawn a circle. That's actually the size of our pipe, so I can make sure I get our pipe dead centered, because it is important that it is centered on the, when we, when we put it on. It has to be centered or we're not gonna get particularly good results. So by drawing a circle that is the same size as the pipe, I'll be able to center that up. Now, I used the black marker pen so I could see the circle, but I'm going to wipe that off before I glue the the, the former on because otherwise it will uh, the glue won't stick very well to the copper. But there we go. Now um, the next step is going to be obviously we need to mark our former with the right spacing for our turns on the copper, and that is because I wrote it down after calculating it earlier, and I've lost it. No, I haven't. 10.4 millimeters. That is to say. Each turn must be 10.4 millimeters from the previous one. But don't get too worried about it just yet. What we'll do is just get ourselves a length of wire and wind it around that former. So at least we have some wire that is the right, well, wound to the right diameter. So I'm gonna, let me just hold on a minute, jump cut. And here's the length of wire that should be long enough. Now I'm gonna try and straighten it a bit because you don't want it wobbly. If it's too wobbly, it will come out looking crappy. So I'm just gonna try and, no, this is not gonna work very well, is it? You can do it with your hands. Just run it backwards and forwards until you get most of the kinks out. If it's got kinks in it, 
because you don't really want kinks, you want it to be as straight as it can be. Yeah, it's looking pretty straight, I'm happy with that. So then you just basically just put a little bit of a bend in there so I can keep a hold on it. Do this, and then I'm just going to wind, do, try and do it in shot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven turns. Not very neat, but that'll do. Seven turns of, well, I'll go right, I'll wind the whole lot on because actually as I stretch it out to, to meet the right place, meet the right points on there, it's actually going to unwind a little bit. So wind it as tight as you can. You want it to be preferably really tight and snug on that piece of plastic because that's the correct diameter. And this is a little bit loose, but I'm, I'm not too worried about that. So if it looks like that, don't be too worried. If yours looks as rough as mine, you'll be fine. Okay, so now what I want to do is take that off there. Now we've got our thing. This is obviously not a helical antenna. Look, it's all too close together. So now I'm going to get my pen. I'm going to mark along here the 10.4 millimeter steps where my wire should appear. I'll probably do that off camera shot because the way I've got things set up, I can't actually get at the bench with the camera going. So jump cut again. Okay, so there we go. I've marked out my little position. It's not going to do anything with that yet. And, uh, but now I've got to go I'm all ready for when I stretch out my copper make sure that each of the turns coincides with it. I have to put a little bit of hot glue probably on there just to hold it because they will be a little bit skewy. So I'll have to play around a bit and make sure we get those things sorted pretty accurately. Um, and now what I'm going to do is drill a hole in this copper and this thing here so that I can put my coaxial cable through and connect it up both to the reflector, oops, get into shot, both to the reflector and to the copper wire that we're going to be sp spiraling around that piece of plastic. So I need to, I'm not sure what the outside diameter of this coaxial cable is actually. I should check it so I know which size drill to use because it wants it to be just a snug fit. And oops, let me reach around the other side of the camera here, see what I can find. This tells me that we are, what is that? That's um, 3 point, that's about a 1 8, 3.6, just over 1 8, 3.6 millimeters. So I'll probably go for a, yeah, I'll go for a 4 mil drill. That should be just about dandy. And I'm going to put my hole just outside that groove because obviously we've got the plastic former there. I'm going to put it just a little bit out so that the edge of the hole just touches the side there. So it'll be two millimetres out is where I shall put my hole, the centre of my hole, two millimetres out from that ring I've already scribed on there. And there's our hole. Whoops, just bang on the tripod there, don't worry about that. So now, in theory, my coax should slide in that hole which it won't because the end of it, when you cut it with side cutters, you end up kind of flattening the end of it there. So I just need to, miss something else. Oh no, I haven't got any pliers here. Jump cut, there we go. As you can see, it's a really nice snug fit actually, because when you get drills quite often, they, they'll cut undersize, and this is obviously just cut slightly undersized. So that coax fits perfectly, it's nice snug fit. So it um, means I can lay the braid out when I solder it on, and then just have the conductor poking through so we can connect it up to our nice piece of, uh, of stuff. <laughs> yeah, stuff, that's what I'm thinking of, the copper wire, of course. Right, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to glue the former to the reflector, okay? That's going to be fairly important. Um, now this, unfortunately, glues are a pain in the backside. This plastic doesn't glue very well. It's very waxy. It doesn't glue very well at all. So I'm going to try, CA probably won't hold it. Um, yeah, it's going to be, I'll have a play with glues, I'm not sure what we're going to use, but it is important that you glue it to the copper side. You need to have it on the copper side, not on the back side. Um, so I'm going to rough up the edge of the plastic tube, I'm going to rough up the copper, I'm going to try and get some epoxy action going on. Hopefully by physically keying the surface of this plastic and the copper, we'll get not necessarily a chemical bond, but a good interference bond, which means that basically the, the epoxy will get into the grooves and it'll act like a um, little fingers holding on. So I'll do that and I'll come back to you momentarily. Hopefully in this shot you can see that I have sanded some quite significant grooves into the base of this piece of plastic pipe and I have taken some abrasive pad to the copper, got rid of that uh, marker pen, but you can still see the circle I've scribed there, so I can still see to align up the plastic thing. Now I'm going to mix up some epoxy and whack that onto there. One thing to be very important, one thing very important though is this must be at right angles, it must be square, so you need to take a lot of care over this joint here and, and spend a lot of time making sure that it's actually perfectly square to the reflector, otherwise things will go a bit skew if and you won't get the results you need. This is probably the most, one of the most critical things is to make sure that this is square, not just cut on the piss like this one, which I did. <laughs> there you go, right, gluing time. One thing I like about this summer is that epoxy goes off much more quickly and it flows easily and it's got a piece of crap in it from somewhere. Um, 
So these things don't take quite as long as they should. Now don't be tempted to use hot glue for this join here because this is metal and metal conducts heat very quickly. So hot glue tends to freeze before it gets a chance to actually adhere to the metal surface. Hot glue is not good for gluing metal, I'll tell you now. So what I'm going to do, I might have to do some of this off camera because I need to get in my head in there and get close up and, is that the right end? Oh, I don't know. No, it's the wrong end. Oh man, I hate it when that happens. Um, okay, so here's the right end. <laughs> I've shot, I just put some glue in the wrong end of our antenna. Never mind, it's all good. It's all good. What I'm trying, of course, I'm doing this deliberately so you can see that even if you're a complete idiot, you can make one of these antennas yourself. See? So there's a means to this madness. Woo! I want to keep it up this way until I've got it on the copper because I want the epoxy inside to sort of form a fillet. So I'm kind of filling it up inside, putting some around the edge here, and then when I tip it up the right way, hopefully it'll all run down and make a lovely fillet. So I'm going to do this with the camera off. One moment, please. Okay, so that seems to have done the job. It was actually a little bit harder to get it centered than I thought because the epoxy covered up the scored ring that I'd made. In reflection, I'd make three or four concentric rings a millimeter or so apart here so that even if you've got glue covering up the inside ones, you can see the outside rings and get a get pretty sure that you've got it centered. I'm pretty sure she's pretty close on here, so I'm not worried too much. And as I say, it's really, it's just this is to prove that you don't have to be sub-millimeter accurate to make these things work. So we'll just leave that now to, to cure and then we'll come back and we'll put our wire on and start soldering shit up. Here we go. Glue is all dry, ready for the next step. Now, you may have noticed that the red marks have come off my plastic pipe. I didn't think that through very well because when I was making the end all rough, those, those marks just wiped off. So I've come up with a better idea. I've made a ruler, ta -da, which has the spacings for the turns marked on it. So now what I have to do is we're going to slip this over here, like so. And what we're going to end up doing is stretching this out. Now one thing I should have mentioned when I was winding the wire on here, you have left hand and right hand polarized, don't you? It's left and circularly, left hand and right hand circularly polarized antennas. Now I'm going to make a right hand antenna here. And with a right hand antenna, when you look at the wire and the coil, it slopes from bottom left to top right. So it's uphill that way. If, it was, if this was a left-hand polarized antenna, then we'd have the turns going from top left to bottom right. Okay, just make that nice and clear, otherwise you'll build an antenna which will work exactly wrong. So I'm going to, before I put my wire in there, I'm actually going to put my, my feed wire in because I want to have something to solder the end of my spiral wire to. So I'm going to prepare the end of my wire by simply spreading out, pulling back a bit of the coax and spreading it out a little bit and then freeing up and just having a bit of the inner showing through. I'll do that now. Okay, now if you're really bad at soldering, this might upset you a bit. This is a little bit of soldering. It's going to be a bit tricky. I'm going to have to solder. Let me find something to point with. I'm going to have to solder just around the edge here to put the to connect the outside of that coax to the copper of our back plate. So I'm just going to put some heat. I'm going to flow some solder in. Again, it's going to be very hard to do in front of the camera. So I'll do it off camera and show you what hopefully turns out. Oh, there we go. Not my best work, not too proud of that, but you can see I've got the outside of the screen of the coax soldered to the reflector, and you can see how that goes through there. I'm going to put some epoxy on the back here just to strengthen this up, because otherwise the flexing of this cable would probably rip that solder joint apart. It's, it's only, it's an electrical contact, but it's not a really good physical contact, so I'm just going to glue that up and then we will carry on. Okay, so here we go. I've got that piece of... Um, coaxial cable. I'll put a fillet of epoxy on the back there. As you can see, I've slipped some heat shrink, two layers of heat shrink. I've got a black one, doesn't go all the way to the end here, and then a blue one that slides over the top. You'll see why in a moment, because this semi-rigid coax is really great, but it does get grubby and it looks really grotty after a while and you get tarnishes and blah. So if you've got a heat shrink over it, it stays looking good for its entire life. So what I've also done is at the end here, I've peered away um, the insulation to leave a piece of wire poking out and I've got my elbow SMA connector here which I'm going to solder on now. So if you get the right SMA connector they're designed for this 402 coax just slides right in there you can see the inner wire has there's a little groove in the pin that slides right into there and then you just solder the baby up and again because of the camera placement I'll just have to do that off screen. Now one thing I hadn't mentioned is the length of this piece of coax. Now if we were able to get our antenna perfectly matched to our system, the, the length of the antenna coax wouldn't matter. But the reality is that without a lot of expensive equipment, it's going to be very hard to get the, well, virtually impossible to get the coil of wire here matched properly to our receiver 
impedance it's called and whenever you have a mismatch of impedance you get a loss of signal and it can be massively aggravated by having the wrong length of coax. So what I've done here is I've used an, a multiple of a half wavelength. Yeah, it's got you glazed over, hasn't it? What, basically what it means is by using a specific length of cable or a multiple of a length, you can reduce the effect that any kind of impedance mismatch at this end has at that end. So I've made it um, 88.3 millimetres from the, where the wire comes out of the coax here to where the wire comes out of the coax just inside the thing there. It's 80. Uh, 8.2.3, round up to 0.3, and that means we're going to minimise any losses due to the fact that this won't be exactly 50 ohms at this end, and it, but it should be 50 ohms at that end. So it's a theoretical thing. If our antenna is close enough, it makes no difference. But if our antenna was wildly out, we would notice a small amount of difference by using a different length of coax. So you can use what's called a multiple of a half wavelength, and a half wavelength at these frequencies is about 17.72 millimeters 17 close enough to 17.8 millimeters because although it's longer than that we're taking into account the fact that the signal travels slower through the coax so we we do some sums and come up with a figure of 17.72 millimeters per half wavelength so as long as your cable is a multiple of that you're going to get a minimum uh, or the any mismatch at this end is going to have a minimum effect on the quality of the signal you get at your receiver so yeah you can either do that or not you know as I say sometimes it makes a difference most of the time doesn't matter Righto, so there's that inner solder joint done there. You can see I didn't do a bad job of that, actually. I'm quite impressed. Now, with these SMA connectors, there's a little Teflon pad that goes inside there so things don't short out. And then there is a little screw end that goes on the back. And with my shaky, fiddly hands, it's just about impossible to do what's happened to my other bits and pieces so I can push that down. Let's just get that seated in place. Then this goes on the back and tightens up. And that provides the right RF environment make sure there's a close match to the impedance and I've lost all my tools so jump cut and it can screw oh, I see what I mean shaky hands that doesn't help today's a good day too so let's just try and get this in here and uh, come on you can do it go go get oh, it's one of the things I hate most about this bloody condition is it really compromises my ability to do things I could do so easily before and before I have a little tanty here, I might just have to do this without you looking. There you go, as if by magic and with a minimum of swearing, it is done. Now I can slide down that blue co that blue heat shrink there, you see, over that little strain relief that. And then I can, heat, I can heat up the whole lot and shrink all that down so it's nice and tight on the coax. And here we go. Heat guns are wonderful things. Considering how cheap they are on eBay, Oh, so it's better to look at the what are you doing and not at the camera, I think. Considering how cheap these things are on eBay, I really do recommend that anyone who is um, doing anything, oops, anyone who's doing anything with electricity and model, even even just you know, um, anytime you need heat, these are just so damn useful. So much better than trying to use a soldering iron or a match or whatever, because you can control the heat. They're not going to melt the heat shrink. They're not going to set fire to anything. They just um, do the job and do it really, really well. Um, I love them. Really, really handy piece of kit that everyone should have. I think I paid 60 bucks US for mine, including shipping to my door. Half a world away from the Chinese vendor that sold it to me. Here we go. There it is. So now we've got our semi-rigid coax and it looks nice. It's not going to go all grotty on us. Got our connector. We just don't have a coil of wire yet. Um, at the moment, it wouldn't do anything, would it? It'd be completely useless. So now it's time to get our coil of wire. And I've got my ruler that I've made, which should be there to get the spacings correct on the coil. And I've got my hot glue gun going in the other room because um, I'm going to have to glue the copper in place. And what I'm going to do, and first of all, I've started already, is just stretch this out so that the, the windings sort of correspond to the spacings. I haven't got it dead right yet. You can see there's... Um, it's still too short, still need to do a bit of stretching in places. So I'm just going to tweak around with this manually until it's roughly right. And then I'm going to slide it onto the plastic former. So leave me while I do that. Okay, now this is where it gets a little bit tricky. You see, I've got a little wire down here and we've got our coil. What we need to do is just get that sitting, just sort of sitting right on top and then just a blob of solder just to hold it in place. I'm going to do that now as again out of shot because I really need to change my camera setup here so you can see me soldering. But it's not a pretty sight, but um, I shall do it and show you. 
Okay, now that doesn't look so flash, but believe me, there is actually a solder joint between the spiral wire and the inside wire from the coax just down there. So now I'm going to, again, I'm going to uh, mess around getting the spacing of these coils correct according to the little ruler that I made up, and then I'm going to put a dab of hot glue right at the top there just to give me the length, and I'll go back and sort of set them all up individually. Right, now you can see with my ruler that I'm pretty close with my wires here. And check it at different places around the thing too, because obviously it could be out on some things. It's, that's a, yeah, I'm pretty close with most of these, so I'm going I'm to leave it at that. I'm going to actually just snip this off here because it's not quite round. Um, I'm going to leave it. It does look a bit random in places, actually. I really should kind of tidy it up. But, I, I mean, this is kind of a bodge one. You can see the benefits now of using a pre-printed former if you want. But... If you're just, you know, like me and just want to do it the hard way, <laughs> we'll go and try this out and we'll, we'll see how it works because you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. So let's throw it on the DVR and fly the 25 milliwatt quad away and just see what sort of picture we get. First of all, we'll do a, uh, a calibration run with a standard Fat Shark antenna and then we'll throw this on and just see if we're getting any gain out of it. Rightio, let's go. Okay, well, that was fun and very, very interesting. Now, the first test. I undertook was with a standard spiro net. That's the Fat Shark Immersion um, spiro net clover leaf. Um, remember, this quad is running 25 milliwatts, and I'm flying out to about 400 meters. So that is quite a reasonable way if I can get this thing to start. Come on, go, go, gadget. There we go. Right. So let's just watch what happens. This is the course I have flown before. I think you're all familiar with it. I just fly along the. Oops. <laughs> and the sun's coming and going, so the picture isn't that flash, as usual with this little quad. But you notice already we're starting to get a bit of noise on the signal as we head away. We're only 100 metres away, and it's getting worse and worse. Fortunately, I was using a, a helical on my goggles, so I could see a lot better than the DVR. But this, as I say, this is just the regular Spiro net, omnidirectional, circularly polarised antenna from Fat Shark. And this is like a reference a lot of people have used these. But look, we've almost completely lost the signal now down at the far end, which is about 400 metres. So... Yeah, 25 milliwatts, 400 meters with omnidirectional antennas. You can't really get much more than that, I think, um, certainly. Um, coming back, it's a little bit better coming back because the, obviously the, um, the, the antenna orientation is a little more favorable on the quad. But we're still, it's, it's really not nice to fly. There's a lot of noise. There's, there's a bit of multi-pathing going on there. And as is usual, I fly back past the DVR so that we get a look at what's behind, how it handles the the reverse, but this is an Omni, so it's exactly the same. In fact, it's probably even a little better than when we flew out the front because we don't have hangers down here to provide reflections. So there we go, we're out at about 200 metres, or 150 metres, looking at that, and we're getting some noise. I'm going to go out across the paddock here now um, to get an idea of, just to show it's omnidirectional, and we're getting a good signal out here. There's the occasional bit of noise, but it's still quite flyable out here at about 150 metres. So yeah, that, I'd say 150 to 200 metres is the limit for the Omnis with the 25 milliwatts before you start getting too much noise. And you can see the signal didn't change much entirely as I flew around in a semicircle um, out the side of the Omnidirectional. So we'll come back in and, and crash in the required spot rather than land because um, the camera angles, the camera tilt's too high on this little thing, I forgot to set the tilt down. But um, let's just go on. Oh, there we go, isn't that lovely? And an inverted half roll at the end, isn't that fantastic? So as you saw, Omni, yeah, it's okay out to about 200 meters, and then it just completely, by 400 meters, you have completely lost the signal. And here we are back, and you can see there is the omnidirectional on the DVA, you can see it up there. I'm now going to swap out the Omni, put in our homemade helical, and we'll see what difference, if any, there is. So there we are, just unscrewing the immersion antenna. How many turns does that take? Goodness me. Oh, there we go, screwed on the I'm just lining it up. I'm just trying to make sure that we get it straight down the runway, get a decent beam. There we go. Yeah, that's it all lined up. So now I'll go back and we will, I'll turn the quad around first so you can see where we're going. There it is. That's the antenna on the DVR, the footage you're watching now. So now we'll go back and we will take off and fly the same course again. And here we go, armed. Let's take off. Let's fly the same course. Notice the battery voltage is way down already. This little quad chews the battery. Mind you, my three cell batteries are so old and tired. Um, here we go, no noise yet, and you know we were getting bad flickering at this stage with the Omni, we're heading out there, it's looking good, there's not a lot of multi-pathing, the circular polarisation is working well, look we're getting out there towards the end of the runway, we're getting out to 300 metres, and by the time we get to the end here it's 400 metres, and it is a perfectly clear signal, that is most flyable, that is like, whoa, this helical has got 
heaps of gain. It's got gain to burn. Look at that. And you can make it with junkyard parts. Bits from your DIY store. Here we go. We'll come back. Just make sure it wasn't a dream. Yeah, flying the whole length back here with that antenna. Look how much more range we've got with the helical. The gain we're getting from that is enormous. But I suspect when we go behind, we're going to lose the signal pretty quickly because this is an optimized helical. Here we go. Wait for it. Yeah, we're getting a bit. Nah, we're losing it, losing it. So there's there's very little out the back. It's probably about as effect, less effective than the Omni. There is not much reception behind, which is what you expect from a, a directional antenna with reasonable gain. Now we're heading out across that field. We're getting a few minor lows, but it's really not flyable when we're outside the beam. Let's come around and see just when we come back in what angle we are from the antenna. It'll give us an idea of how wide that beam is. It's so coming around, coming around. Here we go. No, still waiting. So you see the beam is reasonably narrow on this because we've got, a, I think we've got eight turns on this helical. There we go, we're back in the beam now. So if when we turn around here, you'll see roughly that was probably, yeah, I'd say that was probably a 50 degree beam, maybe a 60 degree beam we've got from this antenna. But when you're in the beam, man, it's just glorious. It's gorgeous. It's actually better than the antenna I've been using. <laughs> oh, there we go. Perfect landing again. Fantastic. So there we go. It's not the most precisely built helical antenna on the face of the planet. It's certainly one of the cheapest um, total component costs. I think it's like uh, $2 for the SMA connector. There's probably about 20 cents worth of cable. That's probably about 10 cents worth of circuit board because it's really cheap. It's not even fiberglass circuit board. We've got probably 10 cents worth of plastic pipe. The copper wire is virtually free, but a heat shrink. Super, super cheap aerial. And the way we built this one, it's a little bit frail. It's not the sort of thing I want to throw in and out of my pack um, because there's two, you know, this using epoxy here and gluing the, the former on with epoxy, probably not going to be really good for being knocked around. But if you want to do some long range stuff with 5.8, you've seen the fantastic difference that a helical like this can make to the effective range of your FPV gear. I mean, it turned the signal, you know, we, we were completely out of signal with this antenna, complete snow, and this was almost perfect at the same range. So we have really significantly increased the range of our FPV using an antenna like this. Now, I didn't, I didn't even count the turns on this one, actually. What have we got? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's about seven and a half, just over seven turns. So that's, I hope I could work it out. It's probably about 11 decibels of gain. I'm pretty sure somewhere around that. But hey, that's, um, you know, bodge. Rough measurements, eyeballing everything. Yeah, should be right, mate. And it works. It works. So don't think you have to pay a fortune for highly precision made antennas because you can do a lot of this stuff yourself. I'm going to do some tests tomorrow. It's getting late now and I'm, uh, I've got to go home. But I'll do some tests tomorrow. I'm going to cut this down to a five turn and down to a three turn. And we'll just look at the difference that makes to the gain of the antenna and also the, the width of that beam. Because we work this out, it's probably about a 50 to 60 degree beam width, which is reasonably narrow. But if you're flying long range and you set this up, you just point it where, like I did on the DVR, point it to where you're going and just fly in that direction and you'll have plenty of distance. And if you do start to get a bit fuzzy, um, you may be moving out to the side. So try flying back where you came from. You know, there's various things. And if you've got diversity receiver, you can put two of these, which will give you a 100 degree total beam width, which is huge. Uh, it's very easy to stay within 100 degrees of beam when you know where the beam's pointed. So there you go. That's it. That's a very simple DIY helical antenna, which I hope everyone will have a go. As I say, you can use baked bean tin for the reflector if you want to. And, and the wires just, you know, just out of the shed, out of the garage, grab a piece of old wire and bit of epoxy and away you go. Now your soldering skills don't have to be that flash. I mean, down here, that's the only bit that might be a little bit tricky, but play around. If, if you stuff it up, just start again. I mean, the materials are so cheap, it doesn't matter if it takes you three or four goes to get a nice solder joint on there. That's fine. And in the next video, I'll talk a little bit also about why this, you notice if you look at this, um, where's something to point with? Here we go. Notice that this turn here doesn't just go up at an angle. It travels around parallel to the reflector for a while before it travels up. And I'll tell you why that is and why that helps significantly with the performance of the antenna. Rather than just sort of starting off at an angle, um, this is what we call capacitive loading to the reflector. And it can make a big difference to the performance because it makes the, the receiver better match to the antenna. And it's all a bit of eyeball guesswork. Work. As I say, there's a lot of black magic in here. And I've been working with antennas for many years. So I did a bit of a guess there. And it worked out pretty damn well. But I will document this all in, on a web page for you because getting it off for video is a bit hard. All the measurements. Um, I'll do some plans up and I'll show you the important things on a, in a PDF or something so you can then just circulate that freely, use it however you choose. Make your own super, super good helical antennas. There you go. If you've got questions, comments, anything to say, put them in the usual place that YouTube still allows. God, the way they're changing things at YouTube, wouldn't be surprising if they take the comments away soon. Um, so there you go. Yes, and big thanks to my Patreon supporters because without their 
support, I wouldn't have the time to do this sort of stuff and bring you things that you might not otherwise know about and might not otherwise build yourself. There you go, and trust me, if New Zealand didn't have such crappy postage rates, I'd throw some kits together and, and sell them, but honestly, the price of postage probably is three or four times the price of the materials from New Zealand. It's just absolute crap, so maybe someone will come along and who's closer to you and start making kits. I'm not looking to make money out of this. I just want to share the information. So if someone can knock up little simple kits like this and you can build them, save you having to hunt out all the parts, because as I say, I had to buy two meters of this plastic tubing for eight bucks to get 100 mils of it. But I can make a whole lot more aerials, I suppose. There you go. As I said, thanks for watching. Bye for now.